Father, we're so glad that we live in a place where we can gather together and we can learn the word of God. And we thank you that you have sent to us the Holy Spirit, that we're not left our own knowledge and understanding, but the Holy Spirit is sent to teach us, to tell us things to come, and to anoint all that goes on. So, Holy Spirit, we now surrender the lordship of all that is said and done into your hands. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to enable me to speak as the oracles of God. Enable me to minister with the abilities which you give to me. I ask you to uh, minister to every person here that when this is finished, our lives will be eternally changed because we have encountered the power which is in the written word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to start tonight with Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read verses 22 through 24. And we're going to be talking, uh, before we really endeavor to enter into the revelation, about the heavenly court. Hebrews 12, verses 22 through 24. But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of of all. I would like you to make note of that. God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. I, I would like you to envision this, this scene, if you could. And I would like you to see how powerful it is. In a sense, I, I want you to have the idea uh, of a courtroom setting. And the thing that makes us aware that this is sort of like a courtroom setting is the way that God himself is identified in this scripture. And the Bible says that this heavenly court has a place where it meets. The Bible calls that Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. Mount Zion is just another name for God's city. Uh, Zion was a place that David captured when he was fighting the Jebusites over the city of Jerusalem. And even in the city of Jerusalem today in the southeast corner is a place called Mount Zion. But Mount Zion is God's dwelling place. It is the heavenly Jerusalem, the, the city of God. And the Bible tells us that there is a group involved in this heavenly court. It says that there are innumerable angels. The Bible doesn't even attempt to count the angels. And then it says there is the general assembly, the church of the firstborn. And that would include us who are dwelling in heaven with God. It is called the church of the firstborn because Jesus Christ is identified in the scripture as the firstborn from the dead. And what that literally means is Jesus Christ is the first person, the first human who ever died and was resurrected never to die again. And this is referring to us as those raptured saints we are, praise God, the church of the firstborn. The church of the firstborn. And the Bible calls us the general assembly, which is a biblical word for the gathering of God's people. So in this setting, there are angels. There, there is the church. And then the Bible tells us that there are those 
spirits of just men which have been made perfect. And those are the Old Testament saints who lived by faith. Hebrews 11 has a list of a lot of them. And we know them to be people such as Abraham, David, uh, Abel, these Old Testament saints who lived for God and now they are pictured as just men who have been made perfect. I don't think there's any way we can really uh, imagine what this is like. Uh, the best that I can say is kind of put it in your own understanding of a courtroom setting. And then there are specific ways that, that this courtroom setting is identified. It says that God is the judge of all. And this is what I want us to consider tonight, that God is the judge of all. Of all the things that we're ever taught about God, probably this identification is the most ignored and the least discussed, that God is the judge of all. If you want to go to the Old Testament and read this scene, you can find it in Daniel chapter 7. We're not going to go there for time's sake, but in that setting... God is identified as the ancient of days. And that doesn't mean that God's old because you understand God is not involved in time. But what this identification means is that God existed before there were days. He was before there were days. And God is the only one who can judge it all because he's the only one who existed before all ever started. We, we cannot judge it all. We cannot go back 200 years and judge it, because we weren't there. All we know is what history tells us. So we are very poor judges of all. But God can judge all. And into this place of judgment, God has inserted the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is identified by a very special word. He is the mediator of the new covenant. Now, the word mediator literally means one who is able to bring two opposing sides together. Meaning that, you know, there's no way to bring them together. But someone comes and stands between and brings two opposing sides together. If you read the book of Job, Job tells us that one of his issues is that he did not have a mediator. He had nobody to intervene for him, to intercede for him. And Jesus is the mediator, thank God, of a new covenant. And he stands between God and man and brings the two together because of a covenant that he cut. So into this scene of judgment, we see that there is this aspect of Jesus the mediator of this new covenant. And then Hebrews chapter 12 tells us there is the sprinkling of blood which speaks. Now, dear people, we could, we could stop here and uh, we could preach for months about all that the Bible has to say about blood. But from the beginning of scriptures to the end of scripture is this issue of blood. And Hebrews, in this scene of judgment, brings not only Jesus Christ into it, but he tells us, the writer of Hebrews, that there's been this sprinkling of blood. And, of course, we know it to be the blood of Jesus. And without doing, you know, a lengthy, detailed 
teaching on this, we know that when Jesus died and was resurrected, there was this heavenly thing that went on, that the blood of Jesus was presented in heaven. And there is a mercy seat in heaven. The mercy seat is in the Old Testament, this place of atonement. In, in the Old Testament, it was the lid of the ark, and the ark is where God dwelt. It had two angels that met their wings over the lid of this ark, and it was called the mercy seat. And the Bible tells us there was a mercy seat in heaven, and Jesus' blood was presented there, and that blood was sprinkled on that mercy seat so that when Jesus entered into judgment and sprinkled his blood for all who are a part of that new covenant, the mercy seat has been sprinkled with blood and the throne of judgment becomes a throne of grace. Hallelujah. We can come to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help us in a time of need. And so judgment is presented in the New Testament with, with this understanding. This was not found in the Old Testament. Uh, there was no Jesus. There was no uh, mediator. This is what Job said. I don't have a mediator. And, and there was just the sprinkling of the blood of bulls and goats and animals. And not only did the writer of Hebrews tell us that the blood was sprinkled, listen to what he says. He says, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, and we've come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks. Blood speaks. The blood of Jesus speaks. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And when the blood of Jesus was shed, shed blood has to be sprinkled. In the Old Testament, they shed the blood of bulls and goats, and they would take a shrub called hyssop, and they would dip the hyssop in the blood, and they would sprinkle the blood. This is what happened on the night of Passover, when, when Moses decreed, that blood be put on the doorpost of houses. And the blood that was shed was sprinkled over the doorpost, and the blood spoke. When death came by, death had to pass over because blood talks. Blood speaks. It's true uh, in this heavenly court. So I want us to understand when we come to judgment, at the last of the Bible, which will be the last thing God does before we enter into eternity, we have to put this into it because these are the aspects of New Testament understanding uh, of God's judgment. Now, let us uh, define what God's judgment is. You know, many times when we talk about judgment, People just have this idea that God's mad at us. That, you know, we just tick God off and, you know, God's just put up with us as long as he can. So God becomes very angry. But let's look at Isaiah 28, verse 21. And God's going to give us in his word a revelation about judgment. And this particular verse is speaking about a place of judgment. It says, for the Lord shall rise up, as in Mount Perizim. He shall be angry in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and to bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now, that word angry there is not angry like we are angry. When the Bible says he shall be angry, it is taking us to this picture of judgment. And the Bible tells us emphatically that it is not in the nature of God 
to be a judge. This is not the uh, uh, this is not the motivation of God. This is not the character of God. The New Testament tells us very clearly who God is. God is love. And yet, you know, here's this picture that the Bible always, you know, kind of presents to us like God's mad at us. And, and that is not really anger like we know anger. It is, it is judgment. And the Bible tells us it's not within God's nature to do this. It was never uh, that God intended to, you know, be a judge. But judgment is God's response to that which is wrong. It is God's reaction uh, to that which, which is wrong. Judgment is not what he wants to do. God so loves the world. Is that not what the Bible says? He loves the world. He sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So this is telling us that God's motivation is not judgment. But God is holy. And, you know, that's another issue that we're not well taught on. It's something that we do not hear, you know, a lot of in-depth teaching. But all through the Bible is this idea that God is holy. And, and you will find that, uh, you know, stories where people touched that which was holy and they died. And this is, this is holiness. We don't, we don't get that. Because holiness is not anything that is natural to us. We, we were not born holy. But God is holy. There are cherubim that circle the throne of God who do nothing but testify to the holiness of, of God. And, and God's holiness has to respond to sin. Because God is holy, he just cannot overlook our sin. He cannot shrug it off and say, well, it doesn't matter. Sin matters. God has to do something about sin. He cannot close his eyes to it. He, he cannot just shrug his shoulders. We are very casual about sin. You know, I'm always telling my grandchildren, don't do stupid. Sin is stupid. Don't do stupid. Sin is stupid. It is stupid. The end of it is death. And, and so we have to understand how powerful the holiness of God is and that God's only response to sin can be judgment. He had to respond in, in judgment. I think when the angel Lucifer ascended to the throne of the Most High God and decided it would be his throne. I think those angels encircling that throne, singing holiness, kept that throne from being touched because holiness judges sin. And God has to be the judge of all. This is what Hebrews chapter 12 told us. Now, the greatest historical event in all of human history, I, I am a woman that was trained to teach history when I was in college. It's one of my degrees. I love history. And as a history teacher, we cannot teach history the way schools teach history. Because there is this pivotal point in human history when everything changed and it was the cross of Jesus Christ. We even mark time by it. We talk about B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domino, in the year of our Lord. We've marked time by the cross. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, you, you can read it for yourself, that at the cross of Jesus, there were two revelations that the cross was this pivotal point and it revealed the righteousness of of God. It, it was God's revelation of what we have to do to be made right. 
And Romans 1.18 tells us that it was also the revelation of the wrath of God. Now let's read Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, and the wrath of God, let's put in there the judgment of God. Let, let's don't put anger, let's put judgment. The judgment of God is revealed from heaven at the cross. It was against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so we see there that judgment was foreign to God's nature. And when God judges, he's not judging people. He's not mad at people. He's judging ungodliness and unrighteousness. And if it's in people, then people are caught by it. People are judged because of that. And it's not God's nature to do that. Now, any of us who are parents understand that. How many of you have ever had to judge your children for unrighteousness and ungodliness? Uh, you know, it's not in your nature to do that. You don't want to bang their heads against the wall, but every parent's had to do that. Even with Pastor Mark, as his mother, I've had to put my finger in his face sometime and uh, say to my boys, you know, and, and to be the judge. And so this is what God is teaching us here, that, that there is this, this issue uh, of judgment. God, it is God's strange act. It is foreign. Let's put defining judgment up there, guys. It is God's strange act. It is foreign to his nature of love. And it is judgment on the unrighteousness of people. It is not anger. And we know this to be true because when Jesus Christ took our sins, the unrighteousness and the ungodliness of our sins, born by Jesus, Jesus was judged. And he died because of sin that he bore for you and for me. So now we, we come to the way that God's going to judge, the methods of God's judgment. I want to read John chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. For the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Now, Hebrews told us that God is the judge of all. We would assume God being the Father. But the New Testament tells us that the Father committed judgment to Jesus Christ. And he, I think, had two reasons for doing that. Number one, it is the way the Father honors the Son. Because if you read the end of Jesus' life in the earth, he was very much dishonored. He was uh, ridiculed, he was spit upon, he was beaten. Uh, his accusers passed back and forth in front of the cross, telling him he had saved others and he couldn't save himself, that he should call angels to save him. I mean, it was ridiculous what men did to Jesus when he hung upon the cross. He was very much dishonored. And even today in this culture, Jesus is very much dishonored. But there is coming a day when judgment will be passed to the Son, and it is the Father's way of honoring this Son. He passes judgment to the Son. And I believe one reason the Father does this is because Jesus is the member of the Godhead who has been human. Yes. Jesus knows what it's like to be human. Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are tempted. Amen. And there, there's always the possibility, knowing human beings, that if the Father were the judge, some human being would say, you don't know what it's like to be human. 
But Jesus knows what it's like to be human. And he is given this position of judge because he is the member of, of the Godhead who, who feels our infirmity. Even in heaven today, Hebrews 4 tells us, Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities because he knows what it's like to cry. He cried in Gethsemane. He knows what pain is like. He knows what betrayal feels like. He suffered in every way that human beings would suffer. And so he understands what it is to be human. But then John 12, verses 47 through 48, tell us further words about this method of judgment. If any man hears my words, Jesus is speaking, and believes not, I do not judge him. So even though Jesus has been made the judge, he does not judge. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and does not receive my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken shall judge him in the last day. So the Bible tells us very clearly the word of God is the judge. All judgment has been passed to the word of God. The Bible calls this the truth. Uh, the Bible tells us we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. And it is that word of God about life, about sin, about heaven, about hell, about Lucifer, about the devil, about angels and humans, and judgment it is passed to the word of God. So let's understand the methods of judgment. Number one, the father is the judge. Number two, the father commits judgment to the son. The son states it is the word that judges, and God's word not his emotion, not, not anything within God. That word is final authority. And I know today that uh, people hold the Bible very lightly. You know, the Bible is not esteemed in, in our world culture. But dear people, the final authority of all is the word of God. When God says it, there's nothing more that we can say except yes and amen. amen. It is truth. It is not to be doubted. It is not to be disputed. The final authority of judgment is the word of God. And we're going to see that when we come to Revelation chapter 20, that, that there's going to be this involvement of books, the word of God. Now, the scope of this judgment, what, what, what is going to be judged? The Bible says we'll all stand, you know, in judgment before God. Well, what is God going to judge? The first revelation is in Romans chapter 2, verse 6. It says that God is going to render to every man according to his deeds. So this tells us God keeps up with what we do. That's scary to me. Is that scary to you? <laughs> God keeps up with, with what we do. He renders to all of us according to what we did here in the earth. He renders according to our deeds. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, it says this about judgment. The Father, who without respect of persons and it's very important that you see that in that scripture without the respect of persons he judges according to every man's work so when the father judges he judges our, our deeds and he has no respect of persons doesn't matter whether we're male or female doesn't matter what our skin color is you know when we were born where we were born there is no favoritism. God does not have favorites. He is a God who judges with, without respect of persons. He judges 
according to the word of God. And then in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Now, nobody in the room can judge secrets. I do not know what's in your heart. I do not know what's in your mind. I don't know what you think when you lay down at night and are in your bed. I don't know what you're thinking right now. I don't, I don't know the secrets of your heart. But the Bible teaches us that all things are naked and open before the eyes of God's judgment. That God is the only one who can go to this depth of judgment. So there is this external kind of judgment where God judges what we do in our bodies, the deeds of our lives, and then there are the secret places. And we're even told, you know, I don't want us to go there tonight, that every word we've ever spoken will give account of it. That even words are our judge. I hate that part of the scripture because I think, I, I don't cuss or anything, but, you know, who wants your words? <laughs> Is it going to be some kind of giant screen? And you think, dear God, did I say that? <laughs> did that come out of my mouth? So, Heads up, you better clean up your mouths. You better clean up your secret places. You, you better watch what you do. So we see the scope of judgment or the deeds don't, done on the earth. Guys, if you'll put that up there so they can put it on their papers. The deeds that are done on the earth. The secrets and the inner emotions of every person's heart. That God will judge all of that without partiality. He has no favorites. He, he is impartial. And then this last point is very important. God's judgment is always right. You know, there's a, a lot that's being said in our culture today about judgment, justice, court systems. And uh, there are a lot of people who say it's right, it's wrong. This needs to be done, that needs to be done. But where God's judgment is concerned, he's always right. There was a time when God was going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. This is found in the book of Genesis. And Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be judged for their uh, bad sexual behavior. It, it was a town of homosexuality, immorality. And God decided that he would judge Sodom and Gomorrah. It's what we call one of these statement judges, meaning this is what God thinks about that. And Sodom and Gomorrah were, was destroyed by judgment. But in this place of judgment, God and his servant Abraham had a discussion about judgment. Because a relative of Abraham, by name of Lot, Abraham's nephew, lived in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. He was one of the city officials. He wasn't really sinful, but he lived there. And so Abraham began this conversation with God. And he said to God, if you could find 50 righteous people, would you judge Sodom and Gomorrah? And then in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, he said this, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer to that is yes. God's judgments are right. And God and Abraham finally came down to ten. And God said, if, I, if there are ten righteous people there, I will not destroy it. And that's where the conversation stopped. I assume there were not ten righteous people there. But this principle of judgment was established in Genesis that God's judgments are always right. And dear people, we struggle with this. Things happen down here that we cannot always explain. But you need to know this about God. What he does is always right. Amen. Never wrong. Amen. It is always right. May not be understood by us. We may not agree with it. But God is always right. right. And so when God judges... 
and we'll find this in Revelation, at the end, whatever happens, God has done right. So the, this is the scope uh, of God's judgment. Now, we're going to come to the end time. Because at the end time, God begins to take on uh, his role as judge. And during the end time, uh, God is, is going to be revealed as, as a judge. And there are what I call three end time judgments that are very peculiar to the end of the age. And uh, these, these judgments are defined very specifically. Uh, two of them are called uh, by throne. The name throne is used with them. We'll read this in a moment. One is the throne of glory. The other is the great white throne. The third one is called the judgment seat. Now, when we come to this word throne, we have to understand we're talking about the government of God. When the Bible talks about a throne, it's not talking about a chair. It's talking about government. And in the world of the spirit, there are layers of government. Colossians tells us there's the level of the throne, which is the highest government there is. That is God's seat of government, the throne. And then there are dominions, which are lower forms of government. It would be like, you know, Washington, D.C., and the president's the highest form of government. And then there are governors, you know, lower realms of government. And then the Bible says there are the principalities and the powers. Now, when the angel Lucifer went to war with God, he took one-third of the angels with him, and it was that level of principalities and powers. So that Ephesians 6 tells us that even we today wrestle against principalities and powers. Those were those angels in heaven that aborted God's plan and God's process through rebellion. And the principalities and the powers fell with Lucifer. So when we read these words throne, I don't want you to just think about, you know, God sitting on a throne like we see him in a picture. I want you to have the idea of government. And when God sits upon a throne, it is about government. What Lucifer the devil wanted was a throne. What he still wants is the throne because he wanted to govern. And that throne is very secure in God's uh, hand. The Bible says nothing shakes the throne of God. Aren't you glad to be under a government that nothing shakes? Amen. Nothing shakes the, the government of God. Now let's look at one of the judgments that Mark has already spoken about, so we will not belabor this, but we will read about it again. Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32. This is one of the first of the three judgments. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, this is speaking about the second coming of Jesus, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And that, that is given a very specific name. It is the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. Now, when the Lord Jesus comes back again, Mark's going into great detail about this, we will enter that time period of 1,000 years, the millennial kingdom, when Jesus Christ and the saints who come with him set up rule upon the earth. And this is a judgment of Gentile nations who were present during the tribulation period. 
And we're not going to read the whole of Matthew 25. But the Bible says these Gentiles, Gentile being non-Jewish, were gathered before this throne of glory and they were separated. Some of the nations were considered sheep and some were considered goats. And the Bible says the sheep nations were those nations that treated the Jews well, that defended the Jews when Antichrist is trying to destroy all the Jews, people who harbored the Jews when they needed uh, care. Jesus said it this way, you visited me when I was in prison, you fed me when I, I needed food, and people said to him, when did we do this to you? And he said, when you did it to my brethren, you did it to me. And it was speaking about the way Jews are treated. So there will be a judgment before the thousand-year period, and those nations that treated the Jews well will be allowed to live in that thousand-year kingdom on the earth. And as I said, Mark's spoken in great detail about that, but that is a very real judgment. And it's called the judgment of the throne of glory. Now, this second judgment is one that we ought to uh, really sit up and take notice of because it is a judgment of us Christians. And this judgment is called uh, the judgment seat of Christ. It is not a throne because this judgment is not going to be about who's lost and who's saved. It's not a governmental issue. Uh, the Greek word is bema, B-E-M-A. I don't know if it'll appear on our screen, but it's literally a platform like this. And there is a seat on the platform. So I, I want you to understand uh, it's not a throne judgment. But there's a lot in the New Testament about this. And this is a place where we need to sit up, listen, because this concerns every Christian. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul, speaking to us Christians, says, For we, the Christians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us may receive the things done in his body according as he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, this is not a judgment of sin. This is not a judgment to say who's going to heaven and who's cast into eternal damnation. It is a judgment of how we serve God. And the Bible has much to say about faithfulness. And Jesus and Luke teaches us if we're faithful in little things, we will be given bigger things. If we're faithful with our money, we'll be given true, we'll be trusted with true riches. If we're faithful in that which is another man's, we will be given that which is our own. Paul writes in Corinthians, it is required that everyone be found faithful if you want to be a steward. So faithfulness is judged. And we will be judged for what we did for the Lord Jesus Christ. God will weigh our service. This is what he said. We'll all appear there. And we will stand before him. And uh, let me read from Romans. It says it this way. Romans 14 verse 10 and then verse 12, for we Christians all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's verse 10. Then verse 12 says, so every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And we will give account. And God has given us much. God has given us purpose. God has given us anointing. God has saved us, and then we'll give an account for what we did with our commission. He told us to go into the world and be a witness. He told us to serve. 
He told us to be faithful. And if we're faithful, there are rewards. And we give account of that. Just like a parent, you know, entrusts a child with things, and children give an account to us. We give them $10, and we want the account. How did you spend it? What did you do with it? And so it is with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, says, Every man's work, and he's speaking here of Christians, shall be made manifest, for the day will declare it. He's speaking about this day when we stand before the judgment seat. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built upon there, thereupon he shall receive a reward. So on the other side in heaven, those who give good account of themselves, those who obey, those who did what God expected, will be rewarded. Uh, not, not this thing of lost and saved, but there will be rewards. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So here's a judgment of fire. I don't want to, you know, get into fire. We're about to encounter another one with the great white throne judgment. I don't know exactly what that fire is. I know that in Revelation, when it pictures Jesus in chapter 1, he's, he's described as this God of judgment. And it says his eyes burn like fire. His feet burn like brass. And it's this very fiery picture of Jesus. And I assume that we stand before Jesus one day and all of us will give an account. I will give an account to God for what I did. And if I've done what God wanted me to do, if I've served him well, if I've been faithful, if I stayed the course, then there is a reward over there. And then there are those people. Uh, here's the way we say it. He was barely saved. How many have ever known people that were barely saved? And they did confess Jesus as Lord, but, you know, maybe they're going to suffer some loss over there. So I just want to encourage you, anything you do for God, God keeps account of it. God looks at us tonight and thank God you showed up on Wednesday night. Pat yourself on the shoulder and give yourself a hand because God keeps account of this. God keeps an account that I stood here and did what I did. And I will give an account to God. You will give an account to God, which ought to make us all live carefully and much, much better lives. So this is the second judgment of the three eternal judgments. There is the judgment of the throne of glory where those nations are divided there is the judgment seat of Christ, which is peculiar to the Christian. It's not a judgment of sin. It's a judgment of service, giving an account. And now we come to the revelation. This is the great white throne judgment. Now let's read Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. This is the last thing God does before we enter into eternity. John wrote, I saw a great white throne, and this is called the great white throne judgment, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven uh, fled, they found no place to hide, is literally what that means, and I saw, now notice this, the dead. These are not saved people. These people are identified by this peculiar word, the dead. And we're not just talking here about dead bodies. We're talking about death. The wages of sin is death. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And here are the books. The books were opened. 
And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead was judged out of those things which are written in the books. The dead were not judged, uh, you know, by fate, the fate that they had. They were judged by the deeds that were written in the books according to their words. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. Not according to the blood of Jesus, according to the covenant, according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Ultimately, death and hell is not an experience in a place. Death and hell are two evil demonic angels that fell with Satan and became death and hell. Uh, you know, more, much, much more than just the place and an experience. And, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, at the end of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, Satan, who has been bound during that thousand-year reign, will be let out of his place of imprisonment. And the Bible uses some peculiar words, Gog and Magog. And he is allowed to go throughout the world among those who have lived in the millennial kingdom as human beings, not those of us who are, are with the Lord already, but these people who have been part of this millennial kingdom, these nations that Jesus said you can come into the thousand-year period, Satan will be allowed to tempt them because the thing about human beings we must always remember is God made us agents of free will. Uh, you are free to do what you want to do, and God does not make us do anything. We follow Jesus. He does not drive us. He does not force us. He is not a controller. And free will belongs to every human being, and free will must be exercised. And I taught on free will one time, and I said the only way free will is free is when you submit your will to God's will. And that's when free will becomes free. But left ourselves, free will is awful. And these people who have lived for a thousand years under the government of Jesus, it is the last dispensation of time. And from the beginning, men have lived under different kinds of government. There was the government of innocence in Eden, the government of conscience in Noah's generation, the government of promise of Abraham, law under Moses. We are living under the dispensation of grace. And this last thousand-year period, when Jesus himself rules in righteousness from the city of Jerusalem, and Satan is let loose so that that group of people can exercise free will. And as, you know, Mark has already taught us, they, they choose to follow Satan. And when that happens, uh, there is this moment of final judgment called the great white throne judgment. The people there are identified as the dead. There's, there's not a born-again person here. They are identified as the dead. And there is this second resurrection. Now, those of us who are Christians were resurrected in the rapture. Because when we stand before God, all of us will stand before God in bodies. We'll not be there as spirits and souls. Uh, we stand before God, we Christians, for judgment for the deeds we did in our bodies. So God joins the bodies back with the spirits and the soul. And the Bible says there's this mass resurrection. Let's read from John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. And Jesus is speaking. He said, all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And, and this is not just Christians. This is everybody 
in the graves will one day hear his voice, and they shall come forth out of the grave. He's talking about bodies being resurrected from the graves. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, the rapture of the church is that resurrection of life. And by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, may we all be a part of that. Uh, The rapture, the resurrection of life. But there is at the end of the age this resurrection of damnation. Revelation calls it the dead, the, the great white throne judgment. Now, this judgment is centered around books. Uh, You read in the Revelation, when it happened, God opened books. And there were books and then the book of life. Because people are going to be judged out of these books. It's an entirely different judgment from what was happening at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Men will be judged not by their faith in Jesus Christ, but by the deeds they, they did in the body. Now, if we just had a long period of time to talk about God, one of the amazing things about God is he has books that he keeps. You know, we never think about God this way. Heaven is very methodical. And the Bible says, in heaven are books. You know, it, our tithing scripture Uh, In Malachi 3, says, God says, you robbed me of my tithe. So God is keeping up with the tithe, the 10%. Because God is a very methodical God. God judges fairly. And there are books. Now, we're not going to talk about these in detail. But I've just chosen some scripture about books. Let's go to Exodus 32, verse 33. The Lord said unto Moses, Who has sinned against me? Him shall I bought out of my book. And I suppose that that is the book of life. And every name was written in the book of life, and sin blots it out. Uh, so God has my book. Acts 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So sins are written down, and repentance erases the sins that have been blotted out. Psalm 67, verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not written with the righteous. So God has a writing with the righteous name in it. Uh, We belonged to a Pentecostal church, you know, in our early years. And one of the songs that we used to sing was this. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. And I believe that's true. Aren't you glad your name is written up there? Righteous people have their name written down in God's book. And then Psalm 139, verse 16, one of my favorite of all scriptures. I'm going to kind of give this my own reading, a little different from what the King James says. God's eyes did see my unborn body when it was yet imperfect and being formed in my mother's womb. Every day of my life was recorded in God's book. Every moment of my life was laid out before a single day passed. And that is what we call the perfect will of God. God has a plan and a purpose for everyone. And before we were born, God had written it out. And to this day, I always say to God, what did you see me doing today when you wrote that page of my life in your book? And that's called being obedient and following God. Just two more real quickly. Philippians 4, 3, whose names are in the book of life. Revelation 3, 5, he that overcometh 
The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So this final judgment is where people stand before God and the books are, are opened and God judges out of these books. The deeds that they did are in this book. And then there is the book of life. And Revelation tells us, whosoever's name is not in the book of life has a destination. It is called the second death. Now, when we talk about second death, we're not talking about physical death being the first death. The first death is we were dead in trespasses and sin. And because we're dead in trespasses and sin, the body will die. But second death is this death from which there is no escape. There is no answer to this. It literally is eternal separation from God. And in the final analysis, God lets men make their own choices about where they'll spend eternity. And these are people who have chosen to live separated from God. If you read about hell in the New Testament, uh, the word for hell is Gehenna. And Gehenna literally means it was a place where they took trash to burn things they, they couldn't do anything with. They're trash. And, and that's what hell is. It, it's not that God sends people to hell. It is that these are people God can do nothing with. God has done everything he can, and he can do nothing with these people. He, he, he has ruled under every kind of dispensation, and people still have chosen not to follow God. So it's not that God's angry, God's ugly. These are just people that God can do nothing with, and he cuts them loose. He cuts them loose to their own decisions. And the final destination is this place that the Bible calls uh, the lake of fire. Now, the lake of fire uh, was never intended for human beings. In Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus said, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, pre prepared for the devil and his angels. And when Lucifer, this anointed cherub, decided he wanted to be God, his judgment is a lake of fire. And it was never intended for man to go there. It was prepared for the devil. And all who choose to follow the devil will follow him in, into that judgment, into, into that lake of fire, is the Antichrist, the false prophet, Satan himself will be there. And it is the final judgment of God. Thank you so much for joining us on the Believer's Church YouTube channel. If you would like more information about Believer's Church, you can visit mybelieverschurch.com. If there is anything that you need prayer for, please email us at amen at mybelieverschurch.com. Be sure to check back next week for a brand new message.